Welcome to Super Connected. With me, Tim Arnold, and my special guests. We invite you to join us in an intimate and honest exploration into the theme of connection. What it means to be connected to each other, what it means to be connected to ourselves, and what it means to connect in an ever-changing world. Welcome to Super Connected. Sam Vaknin is the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited and a professor of psychology in the Southern Federal University in Russia and in many other universities. He is a physicist and a philosopher as well, professor of finance and former economic advisor to several governments and multinationals. Sam is joining me from Skopje in North Macedonia. And I have invited him to come and share his thoughts on social media and human behaviour. Sam, you are oh, connected. <laughs> hello. How are you? Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, just for you know, any listeners who are um, hearing about you for the first time, I mean, I've given a sort of potted biography of what you do but what are you working on mostly at the moment because we've got psychology uh, finance um, uh, you're a philosopher um, and of course um, one of the world's leading um, authors um, and um, you know sources of information about narcissism what are you working on mostly now well I dropped the economics thing and now I'm concerned mainly with the theory in physics which I've developed in the early 80s and has been taken on by mainstream physicists so that's actually my main concern right now <laughs> and on, on the sidelines I teach psychology and still pursue my studies of personality disorders now expanded started with narcissism but now it's more into personality disorders which is a whole a whole field Yes, and we will talk a lot more about personality disorders because that's that's part of what led me to finding out about you and um, all the work that you do. And it's fair to say you're a polymath, aren't you? Because you've you've got your fingers in a lot of different pies. Well, as I told you yesterday, I think we are all forced to be polymaths. We all have two, three mm -hmm. careers in a lifetime. We live much longer. We are forced to multitask and so on and so forth. And this, these are excellent definitions of a polymath. Now, um, when I first came across your name, um, I think it was on a Richard Grannon documentary. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Might well be. Uh, I may have googled the words social media and toxic <laughs> right toxic, and, uh, would, toxic would pertain to me yeah <laughs> and uh, and up you popped um i I've, I've been working on a project for some time which has been my own exploration uh through music mainly uh and film about social media about the narcissistic sides of that uh, in terms of wanting to share as much of ourselves with as many people as possible. Um, there were some wonderful things that you said that resonated with me in a way that I'd never heard anybody talk about it before when I listened to you um, on the documentary. There are two billion people using social media in the world today. Is that right? Um, more. Two billion people use Facebook. Ah, that was a specific to Facebook when you said yeah, two billion. Indeed, it's closer to closer to two point six billion. Wow. Yeah. And what struck me was that you you compared it to or the use of Facebook to a virus, and you sort of talked about it in terms of a virus and what happens. Can you explain that a little bit to me now? Well, the truth is that we use models from epidemiology and virology to describe various social phenomena which incorporate a pronounced dimension of networking. And so um, in the case of uh, social media, which are by definition networks, um, the use of, of such models is, is instantaneous and, and automatic. There is no value judgment 
by comparing social media to vir vir or viruses, we are not making any value judgment. We're not saying they're bad or they're good. We're just describing the modes no. of propagation and the modes of evolution of the networks. Yeah. But one, one thing which might be of interest now in, in the days of the coronavirus sure. is that the, the overwhelming vast majority of viruses are self-limiting. In other words, they have an inbuilt mechanism, the nature of which we are not quite um, <clears throat> acquainted with, but they have a, a, an inbuilt mechanism which stops, stops them dead in their tracks, so to speak. Yeah. They, they infect a certain population and then they stop. And we think this is in order to self-preserve so that they can have, have additional healthy hosts in the future. Mm -hmm. if, if comparing social media to viral networks is a correct anal analogy, this would mean that shortly the growth of social media would stall and then they will reverse and then they will become much smaller, these networks. And do you, you think that's likely? Yes, actually, I do. I see signs of people signing off um, Facebook, uh, closing accounts, going, uh, going off the grid, going offline. I see a counter-revolution in, in uh, developing um, in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think people are fed up with the toxic emanations from cyberspace in general and social media in particular. So, yes, I, I do see a counter-culture developing. But the part that I'm, I was really interested in is um, just how we communicate with each other. And you and I now are actually communicating with the help of the Internet. So it's not a good or bad mm -hmm. uh, thing. It's, it's a container. I guess it's the way it's used by some of the companies. Um, do you think that narcissism is something that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, Obviously, it, 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 Narcissus and Echo, the beautiful fairy tale, um, it, it is as as old as anything. It's not. It's nothing new. The concept of falling in love with the reflection of yourself, um, but uh, that's right, isn't it? Because some people get it confused that it's falling in love with yourself. It's not. It's a reflection of yourself, isn't it? This is, narcissists don't have a self, and they don't have an ego. Mm -hmm. So they are not egotists, definitely. And your your definition is a correct one. Narcissists fall in love with a reflection. Yeah, they fall in love with a reflection of a of a piece of fiction that they had concocted, a script, a narrative that they had concocted early on in early childhood, and then they project this piece of um, this piece of fiction, this narrative, onto others, and they feed off the reflections, feed off the reactions, the feedback, the input that they get from others. And so that sounds like social media is a natural habitat for narcissists. But what I wanted to ask you was, is, has social media brought all the narcissists out to play? Or, or is it creating narcissists out of people who didn't have um, NPD, any kind of disorder before? I think it would be, I, I think it's uh, uh, critical to emphasise that social media were designed with addiction in mind. There is, if you regard addiction as a, as a negative thing, then there is malice or malevolence involved in the design of social networks. Yes. This has been confirmed time and again by former engineers of social media, such as Facebook and others, Google, even Google, <clears throat> as a search engine. And these former engineers yeah. and, and system designers and network designers admitted that addiction and conditioning were in mind when they had constructed the network. So that's not an accident. The design mm. of the networks reflects um, economic and financial decisions uh, intended to encourage the monetizing of eyeballs and creating stickiness so that people do not abandon the networks mm. and do not revert to other pursuits, such as, for example, intimate relationships, such as community activities, such as creative, creative works, so social, social media compete with everything that's good in us and in our societies. They compete with our families. They compete with our friendships. They compete with our communities. They compete with our creative efforts. And this, and is, by, this is by design. It is designed, and, and obviously for a reason of monetization. Would that be fair to say? Yes, the idea was to monetize eyeballs. The longer, the longer you remain stuck to the screen, 
and this is called stickiness. <laughs> the longer mm. you remain stuck, the longer your eyeballs rest on the screen, the more mm. they can be monetized by selling uh, advertising. And so I they don't want you. They don't want you to look at your girlfriend. They want you to look at the screen. They don't want you to look at your friend. They want you to look at the screen, and they don't want you to write music. They want you to look at the screen. Yeah, I mean, based on that, what you've just said, uh, intimacy itself and and deep connections are a kind of enemy of the state <laughs> of, of of commerce, I suppose. Well, admittedly, social networks cater catered to a growing a tidal wave, a tsunami of rising narcissism. This phenomenon has been well documented by scholars, the likes of Twenge and Campbell and numerous others. Scholars have, have demonstrated convincingly that in the last 10 or 15 years, there's a, a rising tidal wave of narcissism, especially among the young. And when we say the young, it's 25 years and younger, mm. or even 35 years and younger. And so these technologies always, always follow trends. It's wrong to say that technologies create trends. They follow trends. Are, are they following? Are technologies following our natural evolution as human beings? Is that what you're saying? Not natural evolution as human beings. That's a biological uh, concept. But social evolution. So mm -hmm. as societies evolve, people react by modifying their psychology and their, their behavior within societies. And then technology caters to these needs. People, yeah. wanted, people wanted to work in factories, so the train was invented. And then people wanted to, to get away from the city, so the car was invented. Yeah. And so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's wrong to put the horse before the cart. The technology simply codifies uh, emergent trends, both in individual psychology and in social psychology. And so social media codified, reified the growing the growing tide of narcissism. And if you look at social media, you see two aspects which are cardinal to narcissism. First of all, the element of reflection. Narciss narcissism, the narcissist is not a person, he is a collective. The classical narcissist is a person who is not a person, he, he derives his existence, he derives his ego functions, he derives his inner landscape mm. from, from myriad gazes of other people. He, he goes around grooming people and then harvesting their reactions. And he mm. uses their, these reactions to create a kaleidoscope which, which replaces what should have been his self. Yeah. The narcissist is a hall of mirrors. And so social media reflects this. They are constructed this way. Structurally, they are, social media are halls of mirrors. They are kaleidoscopes. And you have, you have devices such as the like, um, mm. and so on, which, which foster relative positioning and provide instant feedback. So could you describe social media as an, an alternate reality then? Not an alternative reality in the sense that it is a virtual reality. Uh, no one confuses social media. Well, I mean, in, sort of in comparing it to something like, you know, a, a psychedelic drug that takes you into... To compare it to something much, much more shocking. I would say that social media is an externalized narcissistic psyche, an extern the externalized mind of a narcissist. I if you look at social media, that's precisely mm -hmm. the experience of being a narcissist. That's precisely, absolutely precisely, how yeah. a narcissist functions from the inside. So if you, want mm -hmm. to, if you want to understand narcissism profoundly and fundamentally, all you have to do is look at Facebook. That's precisely how a narcissist mind works. And functions. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's frightening to me because of um, a lot of people I care about are on, on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Um, I've, I've had those moments, as many have, of trying to, oh, that's it, I'm not going to be on Facebook anymore. Because you, you get a, an, an instinct uh, inside that, that, that tells you that there's something unhealthy about it. But then, uh, and I don't think I'm speaking just for myself, I think a lot of people who have tried to come off then are presented with a kind of isolation or loneliness that uh, makes them fearful and then they, they return to social media. Is that loneliness, is that imagined? Is it, is it not real? Is it, are we so far away now from connecting um, in a very human 
way that we don't realise that that is something that is some kind of withdrawal that we've got to go through in the same way that one might do when they give up drugs. Exactly. It's a withdrawal symptom. But our societies are anomic and atomized. They are what used to be called in Marxist philosophy, alienated societies. These are societies where individuals function, function as atoms. And each atom has its own solipsistic, isolated universe, self-contained, self-sufficient, and is, is not in need of any services or goods, actually, from the outside. Mm-hmm. Today, today with, a, with a typical smartphone, you can, you can do absolutely anything that used to have been done 50 years ago um, by, by publishing companies, by media companies. By, I mean, you're a one-man, a one-man economy. Yeah. So you, you don't really need anyone. You need people to grow your food, maybe. But that, that's more or less it. You don't need anyone. <laughs> this was the big thing in, 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 that you said that, that really affected me uh, when I heard you speaking in, in Richard's documentary, was that in some time f- from now, in the future, there'll be two different kinds of human beings. Or I mean, there's millions of different types of human beings already but you said that you could quite clearly categorize them into those that have followed uh, the social media path into this schizoid isolation and those who have not um is that right have i got that right yes i think you you have generally you get things right by the way so <laughs> here's a it's narcissistic supply for you <laughs> thank you <laughs> got, you got this one right i think there will be anywhere between two to three billion people who will not who will fail to wean themselves off social media. They, have, they will have become so addicted and so how conditioned. Ma- how many? Do I think you, between you... two and three billion. Nearly one third of the world, because we're uh, going to well, be nine, bi- nine billion in 2050. Yes. Yeah. Right. Nearly we... one third of the world will be on the grid, and nearly two thirds of the world will be off the grid. But if you talk only about the adult population, it's going to be 50 50. Mm-hmm. So that's a matrix. That's a matrix type model of, of reality. And in this sense, there will be 3 billion people living in virtual reality yeah. with virtual interactions and artificial types of, of connections. And another half of the population, which would constitute a kind of massive counterculture, uh, which will be living off the grid and demonstrably so. It will be kind of an act of, pro- of protest. And, and I think these two irreconcilable um, lifestyles will ultimately clash. Yes. I mean, it's a kind of terrifying thought uh, to picture what you're saying. And I know, I know, I know you say it uh, scientifically speaking and, and with, with great uh, research. The people who are on the grid, on the grid, I mean online, people who, who use the Internet as the main gateway to the world. They consume mm-hmm. news via Facebook. Forty six percent of them consume news via Facebook. They surf. They are on social media, they, they use WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. So these kind of people, people who live mostly online. These people dedicate much more time to, cyber, to, the cyber, to cyberspace than they do to their own children, if yeah. they have children at all. People, people today spend an average of f- almost five hours a day, mm. five hours a day online. Compared to three hours of television, I, books are <laughs> out of the equation, and uh, and they spend an average of one and a half hours a day with their children. How does it make you feel, Sam? I mean, feel. How does it actually really make you feel? I don't feel. <laughs> I don't feel either way. I, I, as I told you, I, I'm not quite sure that the previous model had worked so perfectly. Mm. I mean, we did end up with two world wars and genocides and so on. I'm not quite sure we, we made a hash of it. I'm not quite sure <laughs> because we had a model, a very, a very clear set of institutions which were developed mostly during the agricultural revolution. Mm. And these institutions have survived despite massive technological upheavals. This mismatch, this discrepancy between technology, in other words, human capability, and the institutions which were supposed to contain, channel, and amplify these capabilities, this discrepancy was detrimental to the human species. Mm. Perhaps it is time to develop new institutions, and perhaps these institutions will be highly individualized. 
to the point that every individual will will have be, will have become his or her own institution. Mm. And that's sort of happening a lot at the moment, isn't it? People are becoming their own institutions. Well, people have the capacity today to publish a book. They have the capacity to broadcast. They have the capacity mm. to communicate subver subversively. They have the capacity to flash mob. They yeah. have the capacity to topple regimes, which they have done profusely all over the world with the help of social media. Yeah. So this is the age of the individual. I mean, I, I know it doesn't look this way, but, but it's absolutely <laughs> the age of the individual. And yeah. of course, we have malignancies. Everything in you, every phenomenon in human history and human sociology and human anthropology has a malignant equivalent. And of course, the, the malignant equivalent of individualism is rampant or malignant individualism, also known as narcissism. Mm. Do you think it's comparable um, to, I don't know, 1930s Germany in terms of very young people who would have been growing up then and going into Hitler Youth uh, without knowing the rights or the wrongs about it. It's that's that's how they grew up. That there are young people, very young. I mean, children, uh, are, you know, preteens, growing up into a world where it's normal to not have privacy, to share so much of what you do. And sometimes some of those children, I think, are lucky to have parents who regulate their use of social media. Um, but there are there are many who do not, and there's so many young people uh, broadcasting and commoditizing themselves before the age of thirteen, in some cases, online. Do you think it's similar? Do you know? Do you know the comparison I'm, I'm trying to make is that that young kids are just growing up and they don't know any different. Well, digital natives, of course, of course, don't know any any different, and they regard the world as 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 normal. I mean, the new normal is to them normal. Mm. Uh, however, I do, th I do see three very worrying uh, developments. First of all, there's a fascist backlash against individualism. So we have movements which strongly resemble authoritarian collectivist movements in human history, including... Can you name a few, like, uh, such as... Donald Trump is, is, a, is a glaring <laughs> example, but you have Duterte, mm -hmm. and you have, you, know, you have numerous such tin pot, tin pot uh, dictators in, in mm -hmm. the making or in the breaking. Or in, and so these are... But, but these people reify, they embody a social back, backlash, a backlash of the digitally, digitally disenfranchised, a backlash of the uneducated, a backlash of the left out and the cast out, and so on. Yeah. Mm. So I see this as a problem, authoritarianism growing, um, a battle between uh, Armageddon, actually, uh, mm. between individualism and fascism, in, in any other name. I, I think we're entering a period of, of massive mega conflicts, the likes of which we haven't seen since maybe the Industrial Revolution and perhaps the Agricultural Revolution. I do like to ask my guests about their favourite music. And uh, when I asked you about, uh, uh, if you could just choose one song, you said, uh, Oh, Superman by Laurie Anderson. Tell me about your, your connection to the song. Why did you choose that song, Sam? I chose this song because of some of the industrial, mechanical, technological sounds in it. It, it reminds me of the third axis of conflict. I mean, we have discussed two axes of conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, the rise of fascism against individualism. Can I just ask you? Can I just ask you quick? Sorry, before sorry to interrupt you, but just are you a, a fan of Laurie Anderson in general? Very. Just, okay, okay, yeah. No, it's just nice to know. Yeah, please carry carry on. So we we discussed two axes of conflict. One was fascism against individualism, and one was the rise of men against women. And I think the third axis would be the rise of corporate interests um, against the individual. So I think there are two forces arrayed against individualism. One is fascism, which is the state power, the nanny state, the intrusive state, the authoritarian state. Yes. But on the other hand, on the other hand, also commercial interests, multinationals, who prey on our digital data and are as intrusive as, as a state and very often much more so. And as, as authoritarian as a state and very often much, much more so. Anyone has read uh, anyone is, uh, who has read the agreements which Google forces you to digitally sign before you use their services would understand what I'm saying. 
Very few people uh, do read them, though, including me. I'm guilty of not reading any of those. Yeah, I'm, I'm not mentally well, so I, I read them. <laughs> I'm not sure. Excuse. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm. I'm not mentally well because I've read them, but still, you know. Well, it's a good job you did read them because you can tell us about them. <laughs> well, they are. They are. They are a, dic- a dictatorship manifesto. All of them. All. All EULAs. You know, EULAs. Yeah. All of them are di- are dictatorial, authoritarian, intrusive, confiscatory um, manifestos. Mm. The likes of which I think few dictatorships would have dared to issue, to issue forth, you know. Yeah. I won't mention by name, but there are some uh, tech uh, companies that, that I've worked for in the past that have very similar uh, EULAs, EULAs. And um, yes, it's, it is. It's quite, uh, it's quite alarming what they tell you you can and can't do. <laughs> yes. And so I think, I think we have two, two actually manifestations of fascism we mm-hmm. have corporate corporate fascism the first time in human history and we have state fascism which is the old variant 100 years old variant and um in terms of music uh, which is which is it's been the the most important part of my life for the last 25 years um listening to music making music writing music and and interacting with other people people you know are, are in a very intimate uh, way uh, musically creatively it's it, it, it's existence now in uh, the the realm of the internet and social media is to me feels very secondary um i, I just interested uh, what you felt about that because um i might have got it wrong i think some people just say that i'm a bit old-fashioned but uh i i keep noticing that it's really hard to share any sounds without showing somebody something they can look at nobody's being inspired to shut their eyes <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think a lot comes from shutting your eyes, isn't it? Because it's a, it's a bit like when we go to sleep and, you know, dreams, as you will know, because of your experience as a psychologist as well. I mean, dreaming is such an important part of what we are as human beings in many different ways. And it all happens when our eyes are closed. <laughs> but the... we, we, we live in an age of regression. And one of the regressions, multiple regressions, uh, in terms of human, human, the history of mankind, the yeah, history of humankind. Mm. So one of the major regressions is we we started off with visuals, human human art, human culture, human all over the world, from Altamira to you name it. It it was all based on visuals. You had cave paintings, you did sure. cave texts, yeah, yeah. And then about five thousand years ago, with the Phoenicians and then the Egyptians, we transitioned to text. There were ideograms and other forms of text, but we essentially we transitioned from, from images to text. Yeah. And then there was a period of about 4,000 years in which text, text reigned supreme. We were text-based cultures and societies. In mm. medieval monasteries, people preserved text. This is the great period of the, the libraries. and yeah. Exactly, a great period of uh, libraries, exactly. and, then, and then Gutenberg and the printing press, and newspapers, and newspapers, and, you know, all... all all forms and manifestations of text and, and textual graphics and everything mm. had to do with text. And I think what happened in the past 20 years is again one of the, one, an amazing revolution. We are regressing back to the Altamira cave. We have a digital cave akin to Plato's where visual shadows play on the walls. So we, we have abandoned text in favor mm. of images and visuals. And similarly, because music is a form of notation, ultimately, it's a form of mathematics, harmony, yes. harmony, everything. I mean, it's essentially a form of text. I know it sounds very bizarre what I'm saying, but not at all. Not at all. No, I, I, I believe music is much. Let's put it this way. Music is much closer to text than to images. And and so music is being abandoned in favor of images. Everything that is not image and not visual is abandoned. As a scientist and, uh, and somebody that isn't just uh, guessing entirely from their imagination like I do all the time, um, you, you obviously must make 
some predictions of what you think may happen in terms of the way people are communicating uh, uh, on social media now and the way music um, and art will be um, used uh, in the future. I mean, what 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 thoughts do you have about it? Or because it, it it sounds like uh, some of the older ways are returning. There's, and again, I think it's it's quite important to say there's no judgment on whether it's better or worse it just seems like a lot of the ancient um ways that that we would have approached life um are coming back sometimes there was another old codger by the name of hegel <laughs> hegel hegel proposed the trilateral mm. model of human de human development the development of human societies and ideologies and so on and that's the model of thesis antithesis and synthesis Mm. And I think I think similar trends are, are happening. Even if in music, for example, jazz, jazz is an example of a synthesis between the author-based model, these are the solos in jazz, yeah. and the, the group collaboration model. So jazz is a pretty recent phenomenon, relatively speaking, and it embodies a synthesis between mm. the two rival models. I think in music, I'm giving this as an example because you're a musician. Mm. And I think similar things are going to happen with regards to human communication and human interaction. We are entering an age of augmented reality. That is the ability of, of com computerized digital information to be projected onto our reality so that we wear special glasses or maybe mm. contact lenses in the future. Yeah. And we see... The, instead of, of looking at a screen, we see the info or the entertainment or whatever in the air, superimposed on real buildings and on real people. Mm. So I think we are going to synthesize everything ultimately. We're going to go to a bar. And as we go to the bar, we're going to get information from Wikipedia, if it still survives, about all the important historical buildings on the way. And then we're going to meet our friend and we're going to see biographical information about mm. our friend, which he had allowed us to see. And then we're going to have a drink with that friend and we're going to see, uh, hanging in the air, a description of the drink, its constituents and ingredients and so on, and, mm. and so on and so forth. It's all going to be seamless in the yeah. near future. It's all going to intermesh and interlace. And we are gradually, the distinction between real reality, <laughs> virtual reality and augmented reality, these mm. distinctions are going to blur. They're going to look very artificial. I mean, the digital natives of, the, of 2050 won't understand this conversation at all. Gosh, yes. I mean, it, 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 all of those realities sort of come under um, what um, Arnold Mindell would, would term consensus reality. Um, what do you think about uh, alternate realities? What do you think about dreaming and social dreaming which is um it, it's something i've learned about quite recently but oddly was also discovered in 1982 which i know that's that's an important year for you too isn't it <laughs> yeah it's the year that i i wrote my my doctorate in physics yeah yeah um do you know about social dreaming yeah yeah what do you what are your thoughts about that i mean i'm fascinated uh, because you've got such you know strong um scientific kind of uh, view on so much what what ever since um a chap by the name of descartes uh, rene descartes mm -hmm. in in the 17th century yes we have had this misguided belief that there is reality and there is us like we are observers, we are spectators, and we, are, we document uh, what we see and what we... There was a split in the world. He created a schism. He broke the world apart. He created the duality of mm. the world and us. He did admit that the only certainty is that one exists. One cannot be certain about reality. But he still, he still made this distinction. He still broke the world into two, two big, big pieces. And of course, this was very artificial and very wrong. We do not perceive, we do not perceive reality. We perceive internal processes in our brains. We are inward looking. We are introspective. We, we, we sample the world. 
by the way, a very low bitrate sample, mm. which would not pass with any music studio in the world. <laughs> so we, we sample the world, and then we take these bits of info, and we, we insert them, we apply them, we apply models in the brain, mathematical, mathematical complex models that we have in our brains, and we create reality as we think it should be. Yeah. Now, so we live inside our minds in any case. These, yes. these distinctions between real objective reality and subjective reality and alternative reality and dreaming in the individual and social dreaming, and this, all these distinctions are a misunderstanding of how our brain operates. The solution or the answer to your question lies in an obscure field called neuroscience. We are beginning to understand the brain and our senses in ways which have defied us for millennia. And what we are discovering is nothing less than astounding. There is no world. The, the ancient Eastern mystics were right. There is no world. Mm. There, is, there are just ever-shifting kaleidoscopic models of the world, which are triggered by external stimuli. These external stimuli are, of course, by definition, outside, outside us. Yeah. But the models are where we live. We inhabit the models, not the world of the stimuli. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can generate and create stimuli in other ways, the other models in our brain will be activated, and they are equally valid models. It's, it's very important to understand. People keep asking the utterly idiotic, inane question, is, mm -hmm. the, world a, is the world a simulation? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> I, I like that a answer. Simulation, a simulation yeah. is reality. Yes. A simulation has to take place in somewhere. It has to consume some resources. It has to be in, in, in some hardware. Or if not in some hardware, it has to be in some brain. It, it has to have an existence. As long as it has an existence, its validity as a construct is mm. equal to what today we erroneously call reality. And of course, whatever the reality is, uh, we have to learn to survive in it, right? Yeah, the models we have in our brain are survival friendly, of course. These are not accidental models, and Darwin was right about this. These models were created very carefully, crafted very carefully over millions of years, to aid and abet our survival and to allow us to convey our genes forward in time. Um, Tokens. Just before we finish, I have to, well, almost, almost asked you about everything I want to ask you about. But we could, I could uh, listen to you for hours. Um, we try Thank to you. That makes two, <laughs> makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's very kind. Um, it's, it, it, it's the, obviously the, the climate change situation that has gripped all of us, um, you know, in the, probably over the last 20 years, but certainly in the last few years. Uh, it, 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 is, that, is that something you feel where the planet without the human beings on it has its own voice? Is it trying to say something to us? Well, there's of course the the popular Gaia Gaia theory. Yeah, what do you, yeah? I just wondered what you thought about that. Well, we are a part of the planet, a very important part of the planet, and in this sense, we are an organ of the planet, and we operate on behalf of the planet. We never ever operate against the planet. Whatever happens on the planet is the planet's. So climate change is an effect we are having on the planet. Cows have a similar effect on the planet, by the way. Mm -hmm. we, we are having an effect on the planet. There is no, no question about this. Just before we finish, I almost asked you about everything I want to ask you about, but we could, I could uh, listen to you for hours. Um, we try and Thank you. That makes two, <laughs> makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very kind. Um, it's, it, it's the, obviously the, the climate change situation that has gripped all of us, um, you know, in the, probably over the last 20 years, but certainly in the last few years, uh, it, 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 is, that, is that something you feel 
where the planet without the human beings on it has its own voice? Is it trying to say something to us? Well, there's of course the the popular Gaia Gaia theory. Yeah, what do you? Yeah, I just wondered what you thought about that. Well, we are a part of the planet, a very important mm. part of the planet, and in this sense, we are an organ of the planet, and we operate on behalf of the planet. We never ever operate against the planet. Whatever mm. happens on the planet is the planet's. So climate change is an effect we are having on the planet. Cows have a similar effect on the planet, by the way. Mm. We, we are having an effect on the planet. There is no, no question about this. Anyone mm. who denies climate change is Donald Trump, you know, which sure. is not a compliment in my book. Mm. But the, the metaphysics of climate change, the philosophy and ideology which were spawned by this indisputable scientific fact, they are wrong. Yeah. Climate change is a, is a natural phenomenon because we are a part of nature. This is, this is the cart. This is the Cartesian mistake of saying there is us and there is nature. No, we are part of nature. Yeah. I, I really could talk for so much longer, but we've only got an hour on the show. I have one last question. Um, and I, it's the same question I ask everybody on this show. And that is, what is the most important connection in your life, Sam? Connection, you mean human connection? A, any, no, it can be any... The, books. Uh, uh, books. Book, hand, hands down books. Yeah. I'm addicted to books. I love books. I love their smell. I love their texture. I talk about books the way most men talk about women. <laughs> I make love to them. Oh, well, that sounds like a very harmless and healthy relationship. Not, Sam not for the books. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Vaclin, thank you so much um, thank you for, having for me. being my guest. And I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. So do I. Take care.